Today's episode is a partnership with True Tone, truetone.com. Well, hello, friends, and welcome to the True Tone Lounge. Today we have an extra special episode with two legends of the Nashville musical scene. We have Steve Warner, esteemed singer, songwriter, and guitarist, and friend, and Joe Glazer, inventor, guitar repairman, and guitar builder extraordinaire. And we are going to tell a bit of their story and how their stories intersect with these two wonderful Glazer made instruments that he made for for steve and became really kind of part of your look and persona and became something that are just very much identified with you yeah i think that's correct uh yeah and i i don't know that a week goes by that i don't have someone asking about joe and about b benders and you know what i mean or a few days of every few days i'll someone on social or somebody will ask about b benders or the red tally or the you know uh, so it's yeah we're definitely connected. Unfortunately for Joe, we're connected forever. You know, so. <laughs> well, you know you can imagine the opportunity that it represented. I mean, everybody's career is is anchored in some luck, as we know. Boy, that's for real. He, and you have a lot of different opportunities to take advantage of it. But there's a certain amount of you put time into something and it happens to work out. But for me, that was a that was a huge opportunity. And, well, and you're being modest because you make you made a lot of your own luck by making awesome instruments, and, and that's true. Not patting backs, but here, but yeah. yeah, those were great guitars. We, I knew it. Ricky Skaggs knew it. A lot of people, Jimmy Olander, a lot of people knew it early on that you were making some extraordinary instruments, and they were they were really unique and very cool. You know, so well, let's pull back and let's get, let's get some context. So. Joe, you were out in California, and your parents were doctors. What kind of doctors were they? My mom was a psychiatrist. Yes. Which probably explains a lot. <laughs> yes, it explains his bedside manner. <laughs> I'm, sorry, I'm sitting there going, mm. <laughs> She, you know, she changed careers sort of at a certain point. She was a, um, a pediatrician of, of, of sorts, and she decided she wanted to go back and become a psychiatrist. And my brother and sister have always insisted it was because as I... As I uh, you know, turned to the dark side. <laughs> they figured it was a good investment to get ready to help me um, in my struggles as the black sheep. Um, but they, I mean, that's sort of a joke about bedside manner and all that. But but we end up being reflecting our our um, influences. No and, question. And as I got older, I, I realized that a lot of what I get to bring to the gig it comes from my mom and my dad yeah when and and so you mentioned being a black sheep and that has to do of course with being loving music and getting and you were you were a pedal steel player in a loose de definition <laughs> i worked as a pedal steel player you were, you were paid you played yeah. gigs i was paid yeah oh and called back. told me about gigs that you played then you were professional yeah. you were paid <laughs> So, and and you've told me through you know some of our own conversations that you you loved the, the kind of the scene that was going on in California for everything from like Buck Owens and Merle Haggard up through like Emmy Lou and Graham and and Rodney Crowell and Albert Lee and all mm -hmm. those characters. And so, how did you end up moving to Nashville? And James Burton and James Burton and James Burton and James Burton. Yeah, there you go. Sure, Good. you know. I was playing in a band called Midnight Flyer. It was it was uh, it was named after that that uh, Eagles. Uh, well, it was a tune that the Osborne Brothers did that was written by. Um, uh, the, uh, they got dudes and I feel like moving on, traveling on. Um, Ooh, no, Midnight Flyer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. That, and the guy who wrote uh, um, Paul Kraft. Yeah, Paul Kraft. Paul Kraft wrote. Paul Kraft wrote okay. Yeah. Anyway, but we great made, songwriter. Great man. songwriter and a. Uh, uh, um, self-described genius he was like he, yeah he was in that what's the society of uh mensa, mensa. mensa yeah, yeah. And, he, and he never let you yeah. forget it yeah um just in case you slipped your mind he yeah. would remind you yeah he wrote to keep 
to keep me from blowing away. And he wrote, um, it's me again, Margaret. And <laughs> Linda Love is Sit yeah. on My Face or whatever that thing was. He wrote, he was a great songwriter oh, and, across a broad oh. spectrum. Um, yeah. And Chet, by the way, a little tidbit. I'm sorry to interrupt, mm-hmm. but he was the last artist that Chet produced on RCA. I was the next to the next to last, and then he signed Paul Kraft, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, I went on to work with Tom Collins producing, and then Chet signed Paul Kraft. Mm-hmm. But I thought a little trivia: he was the last mm-hmm. artist that he produced. Um, so. He was an interesting cat. I did get to know him. worked worked on his stuff. Um, anyway, we were in this band, and there were two really great guitar players in it, and I playing steel, I was almost useless, except that I was the only person who understood arrangement. And so um, I, they, they called me the Lone Arranger because, <laughs> because I kind of was like, whatever anybody else's ideas were, it's like, guys, that's not how it's done. N- not everybody plays at once. Not every, you know, you don't start in full blast, you build, you know. And so that was kind of uh, my, um, that was my role playing the way I played, but these two guitar players were both really good, and there was nobody who worked on instruments. So one of them worked on the other guy's guitar, John Abraham and Rick Eshelman. And it was this, John Abraham would work on this stuff, and it was ham-fisted kind of, you know. And I remember the first time I said, hey, hey, I see what you're doing, let me just do this for you. And that's where it all came from. So how did you get to Nashville? We talked about, so I was doing a Silicon Valley gig, you know, and um, I've, I've told the story a bunch of times, but I, I went and interviewed at Hewlett Packard for this gig. It was it was with the guy that invented the, or, or was, yeah, he inve- basically invented the laser printer, and it looked like such a ridiculous, you know, the, built, the thing was the size of a room and slow and noisy, and I thought, this is going nowhere. And this girl I was hanging out with who uh, um, was thinking about moving to Nashville, April Barrows, a, a jazz yeah. art, songwriter, artist, she played bass in the band. She was thinking about moving to Nashville. And I think we misunderstood what was going on in Nashville. Pre-internet, there was no way to see where music was coming from. You'd buy these records. We were joking about Reggie Young earlier today, but it was a long time of of knowing that there was this certain sound on a record that um, it was a long time between figuring out that there was somebody and finding out that the person was named Reggie Young <laughs> because there was a, a Danny O'Keefe record that came out, oh, Good Time Charlie. Yeah, the, Blue Jays. the first record that Ooh. identified the players where it was Reggie Young. And I didn't know he was from Memphis. I didn't know that... Um, all these other people from L.A., there was no way of knowing. I moved here out of the blue, thinking that, that Haggard and all that, if it was country music, it was coming from Nashville, and that was just totally wrong. So that's how I ended up here. Yeah. And then you you were playing, and how did the guitar building, and then, of course, that, that kind of you know, rolled into repair work, but how did the guitar building start? It started in California. Two things. One is I loved a certain kind of music that involved the steel and involved the string bender with Gene Parsons really I mean people have been doing mechanical string bending for a long time since the 20s but he really he and Clarence White turned it into a guitar a strap activated thing for guitar and I love the sound of it there's a certain people can bend strings but there's a certain style that comes from that mechanical start and stop and Clarence had his own his own um, take on that and then Bobby Warford had yeah. this inc- this wonderful uh, slant on Clarence, or they co-developed it, or it's hard to tell. You know, I wasn't around then, so I, I mean, I wasn't there. But those two guys, man, for real, Warford, yeah, both though, I mean, both are just incredible. Yeah, just- and and you know, War- Bob Warford is still. I mean, I've I've met him online and through you and. Uh, communicated with him in the last couple of years, which is a huge reward because he was so influential. He's under-recognized. You know, he's under-appreciated. But I started, I was totally fascinated by that sound. And the guy that I was playing with, Rick Eshelman, brought in these songs that um, he was like, uh, um, all these songs that featured fairly obscure, Willen and... um, uh, uh, that Roadmaster stuff of, of um, 
What's that artist? Um, Freddie Weller. Yeah, Freddie Weller. Yeah. The Freddie Weller stuff, the Randy Newman stuff. And we played a number of those songs, and they all had Bender on it. And Rick Esselman was very good at doing that with his fingers. He could even sort of start and stop as mechanically as anybody Imitate I've ever heard. That, yeah. yeah. But I just thought, wow, there's there's a way to do this. And I, I started messing around with it. Somebody had told me that the Clarence White thing worked, that the neck, that the neck rotated on the body. And so I took out the four neck bolts and put a center one in and tried that. It's like, yeah, that'll bend the B string, but everything else goes completely to hell. Right. And and so I thought, it can't be that. I tried to go visit Gene Parsons. I drove up to Casper, California, where his place was, and he was out of the road. So I I and I had I'd seen Clarence, but always from a distance. I didn't have any appreciation of what that knob was on the front or anything that was going on. So I just dove in into it by taking some of the concepts from my Showbud crossover steel and hacked apart a, uh, um, uh, his 67 telly, which Man. nowadays would be, <laughs> you know, no, <laughs> we do don't do think? those. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But that was like, that thing was only nine years old at the time. Absolutely. It wasn't even, yeah, yeah exactly. Wasn't, hey, you don't think of that. <laughs> so I made a bender and it worked. <laughs> It actually, I found it the other day. It's at the shop. It looks like it was made by cavemen, but but it it worked. And then just one thing after and after another, and I, I built a guitar to house the second one. You know, I added the first one to his old telly, and then the second one. I was like, I'll I'll make a guitar and I'll put I'll build this in, and I made it out of hardwood out of uh, Paduke from Vermilion, which is yeah. kind of like a rosewood. It's really hard, and nobody knew that. Certain woods sounded better than others, right? And nobody knew that putting that that coffee table finish on it, you know, with, with, that you could bury a peso in. Um, they, they, <laughs> they, they thought that was cool. Seventeen coats of hand rub, you know, and I made that guitar and it sounded terrible. And then it was just a long evolution. And about that time, I moved to Nashville and met a few critical people who who were on their way somewhere. Uh, you know, everybody that that I met was on their way somewhere, and that that kind of ability to to ride along in the wake made my career. So, how did y'all meet? That's an interesting question. I'm thinking Bucky Baxter might be involved mm-hmm. in that mm-hmm. one somehow, because I remember we Bucky was a, a mutual friend. He worked for me for a long time. Great steel player. Uh, worked with uh, Steve Hurl. I don't know. I was his. He worked. What did he have before me? I can't remember. Um, Joe, did he play? I know he played with Steve Earl after me, <clears throat> and then Bob Dylan. He played with. Where did I? When he came to me, I, where was he? You know, <clears throat> was he still in Virginia? No, no. He lived here. He came here with. I should have looked. I should have researched this. I can't um, remember. At, at a certain point, my recall of proper names is not what it was. It was a. It was uh, whoever it was in Sugar. What was that band? Oh, David Sugar. Sugar. He was yeah, David Sugar. Sugar. Dave Rowland. Yeah, yeah. He yeah. was working with Dave. That's right. David I Sugar. remember that. He <laughs> and wow. I think that your gig was his big step up from that because of the fact that you were an art. You were an artist, and I was just kind of taking off and starting to have records and. But modern, not that Dave and Sugar weren't modern, but you represented that. That no, I know what you're cutting saying. edge. <clears throat> the potential cutting edge, which people were looking for, it was not defined, but there were a few people who represented this cutting edge in a very conservative business that, yep, yep. you know, that wasn't going to have any, any of it. So, Steve, kind of tell us where where were you in your career at this point when you're when you're meeting Joe? I had just. We had just started taking off pretty well. I remember I just bought a bus. <laughs> yeah. That was a big deal to me because yeah. I would we, uh, you know, uh, we were we'd been on the road. I'll back up just a little bit. Let me brief digress for Please. a second. I, we were we were uh, struggling out on the road. I had a motorhome. Believe it or not, we bought a little motorhome and pulled a trailer. Uh, paying the dues out there on the road, and I told the guys, I said, "We're going to get to a point. We'll be getting in a bus." I wasn't even in a motorhome for about a year, but we bought a bus. So that was around the time I was starting to really be on country radio, doing a lot of TV, and be pretty visible. And um, and we, I had a, let's see, my brother Terry, 
playing drums. Mike Foster played keys, and myself, TK Campbell, who went on to manage Toby Keith and uh, went on to do uh, some awesome things uh, down the road. Uh, we're still great friends, but he played bass and tour managed. Now we needed to add another piece to the to the group, so we I go well. I, you know, being a steel loving guy, I said, well, we need a steel player that maybe can play guitar. So Bucky came on. That's where Bucky came. And I remember, I believe that's around the first time I met Joe. I knew, I knew of you, Joe. I knew of you. I knew. If, if your record was out, was it, there was steel on the record? Yeah, Sonny Garrish played on a lot of my early records. Uh, so most most bands had what it would take to reproduce absolutely. the record on, absolutely. on the road. Absolutely. Yes, and Sonny Garrish was playing these mm -hmm. cool parts, mm -hmm. and uh, the very first stuff I did with Chet producing, uh, Buddy Emmons played on that early stuff. And then when I went later, I started working with Tom Collins, Sonny mm -hmm. Garrish was there. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Bucky was playing a lot of those lines, mm -hmm. and uh, I remember you coming on the road with us and traveling <laughs> with us, and we played some shows here and there, and you were with us, and, 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 and uh, my apologies, I, I don't remember, <laughs> but if I need to say I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> that was a, a great eye-opener. What was wonderful about that that time I went for a few days with you guys to Texas was that it verified what I heard about the road life which was unbelievable <laughs> but but you know it was, it was good times it was innocent good times I mean it, it, yeah it was it was just really remarkable I think people uh, I think people understand a little bit about what it's like to be in a band but it, it is a it is a closed culture that, that's pretty remarkable but but I think my recollection yeah Bucky Bucky introduced us I don't know why the subject came up of the guitar and the bender but um, I think I probably I might have already made Bucky one and so somehow it came up and and it was it was a great opportunity. Well, I I can interject here and tell you. What, now, I'll back up to my gig before I started making records. I played three years with Dottie West, played bass. And right. then I played when I first came to Nashville in the early 70s. And then after three years, I played with a great uh, artist named Bob Lumen. Mm -hmm. uh, who was on Epic in Columbia. He made some great country records. Lonely Women Make Good Lovers was a big... He did, had the original big hit on that. Uh, neither one of us wants to be the first to say goodbye. He had a big hit. Warford played on... on that's, and that's where I was leading. He, he played... Bob Warford played on some of those. He played on Lonely Women. Yeah. It's very... Very in the background. You got to listen. But man, he played some awesome Bender mm -hmm. stuff on mm -hmm. that record. And... Therefore, and he did some other. He had he had Billy Sanford playing a lot of stuff, but mm -hmm. he also the Bob Warford stuff intrigued me. But he had a guy in his band, Bob Lumen had a guy in his band. I played bass, but when I joined the band, he had a guy named Rip Wilson who played oh. who played in his band, and he played yeah. B Bender. Yeah, yeah. He was a Bender player, and mm -hmm. uh, he loved Bob Warford, and so I really got fascinated, and I knew of B Benders uh, through the Parsons, but I. When, with Lumen and with Rip Wilson in the band playing beat benders on everything, back basically, uh, I was hooked, you know. And then here comes Joe Glazer coming along. I'm like, wow, where he's talking beat benders, and I'm going, my ears perk up. I mean, yeah, we're, yeah, we're, we're, so you start talking about making guitars, and I knew you'd made Bucky one, and I'm like, oh yeah, we, I gotta, I want in on this. So, what kind of bender did Rip Wilson have? He had a Parsons kind of a bender. Did you ever, Joe? Did I you made, cross? I'm, you I, made. Yeah, you worked I made with him, didn't you? For him too, yeah, yeah, I thought you did. Did but you I, have one of your? Did you make him a bender, or did you? I you probably worked on his stuff, probably. I, you know, I, I remember making a neck for him. I don't remember whether I did a, a bender for him, but I, early on, very early on, when I needed the work, he came to me and had me make a neck, which which later I bought back. It's one of the few things I have that oh, I made. Oh wow! No, I didn't know about beautiful that beautiful bird's eye neck. It's actually an incredible neck. He he had a telly that was uh, just I think it was a kind of a Parsons long pull, mm -hmm. you know, uh, B bender, 
and uh, he was a big guy, real funny, funny guy too. He was always. I remember once we did a show somewhere, and he right before the show he went out to set his stuff up, and he had played a Morley pedal that made his foot be up like really high. And I remember there was on the front row. He went out and he had this twin that had JBLs. It was the loudest amp I've ever heard in my life. And he went out and I saw him kind of tweaking the angle of it. And then I looked and there were some little old ladies on the front row. And he he said, I just wanted to, I go, what are you doing? He goes, I want to make sure these are pointed right at those little ladies. You know, he was he was aiming it. I go, rip. That's <laughs> awful. He, he goes, oh, make sure they're going to get all this twin rerun. Get, get all the, the So, But he was a funny, funny guy. And I learned a lot from him. And and uh, I always, anytime, I only touched a bass when I was on stage, all my bass gigs. The minute I was off, I was looking for a guitar to play. With Rip, I was looking to play with his B-Bender, you know, I wanted to mess with that. And so that was kind of how we uh, hit it off. So you were primed and ready for a B-Bender. And you no were building question. guitars as a way, as a, almost as a vehicle for the Bender at, at, in the kind of... Absolutely. You know, I yeah. mean, the first, you know, the... the when I started building them, coming at it as a steel player, I thought about what's the what's the next step, or what is what's logical, or what would I like? You know, I was very influenced by my steel style was influenced by as much by Clarence White and Albert King, for that matter. You know, playing playing whole step blues bands as it was Emmons and Lloyd Green and Jimmy I, Day and stuff. I was thinking you might have ran into Hank DeVito out there oh, on the West Coast. No, but I, I certainly got to know Hank here. Yeah, um, absolutely. But so when I, the very first stuff I made, the very first guitar I made was a single pull. And then after that, I made these double pull and triple pull, pull benders. And my patent, my original patent, which was like 79 or whenever it was, was a down and out, and then uh, an in. It had a paddle on the back that you could pull against oh, your wow. belly, oh, and it, wow, it wow. dropped the low E like on a like on the C6, yeah. where you go yeah. all the way down there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, major third, minor third. Yeah. Which is what's interesting about it is that, and I did this in the actually I did this that thing I did well before I moved here, and to get it to stay in tune, the the low E thing to come back, I had to. I figured out I had to lock it down at the nut. So I made a locking nut. Wow. You know, a one string locking nut. Which, when I got around to patenting all this stuff, my attorney said, Well, what about that thing? You know, pointing at the locking nut. I said, Oh, that's nothing. That's no. And, and that turned out to be a huge mistake because the whole Floyd Rose um, Kaler. Busted wide open, right? Well, the, they they got into this huge legal battle, oh. and a lot of it came down to because everything else had been done by Mose Wright or something else, except the locking nut, which Floyd Rose got credit for. But but I think I predated that. Um, That's unreal. Which man. which, if it were true, and if I had had the foresight to patent it, which I didn't, it might have been of significance. You mm -hmm. know. I know you might not be having to ride a bicycle today as much as I can <laughs> yeah. have a car. And Joe, do you, do you remember we talked about, uh, I remember talking to you about a Strat. You know, I said, what about a B-Bender on a Strat? You know, I thought that was an intriguing, because I never, you'd only seen them on tallies, you know. And I remember us talking about that. That was the first one you made me was actually a Strat. And maybe the first Strat. I mean, I don't, I don't know, but I think that may have been the first Strat I, I ever put a Bender on. Yeah. Have you done many since? I I've done a, uh, you know, we we now do a few a day, you know, and maybe so maybe of the fifty or sixty or whatever it is per month, maybe one or two of them is a strat, maybe one is a strat. So it's not very many, but it's it's doable. Not on a not on a strat that's got a, a vibrato on it, but certainly on a hardtail. And there's well, no I was, not. Absolutely, I was always. You know, Ryan, my son Ryan, and I were talking this morning actually, and he said, "Dad, you know, you're." Because people kind of associate you with a telly, but he goes, you really are a Strat guy. And I think he's right in a lot of ways because I've played, my brother Terry is a total Strat geek. You know, he's always been a Strat guy. And I played his 60 Strat on the road. Well, Robbie, when you yeah, were with yeah, us, yeah, I was huh, playing his that. 60 Strat. And then Paul Yandel made me a, uh, <laughs> I had a T60 that was kind of a, a Franken, a Frankenstein guitar that he made into a, it was really a Strat kind of sounding guitar. It was a PVT-60. <clears throat> but, um, so that was, uh, 
that that and then when then when you made my B bender, I went to a Strat. So uh, I've always really been a Strat guy, I guess is what I'm saying. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> So now we have the, the Strat in question. So you were just talking about the fact that you were kind of more of a Strat player. And so how did this come about? Did you ask Joe about, you know, building this? What happened? I think on our, on our between that road trip we speak of and just being around each other through our friend Bucky, we just kind of started talking, you know, hey, how about making me a Strat, Joe? You know, I kind of hit him up. And uh, a guitar, and then I think it went to Strat at some point. You certainly had this by the time that road trip um, happened. Um, but yeah, I was wondering the timing on that. I think we met somewhere and had a, a, a conversation about it. Like I think we did, too. And, and, and then I said, how about a Strat? Yeah. What do you think about that? <clears throat> and so this was the first Strat you did with a bender, correct? Oh, I, I'm pretty sure. I mean, I did some after this, but I'm, I mean, I can't be... 100% sure of that because I did one for Harry Robinson at one point a, a double but but I don't know I never seen one I'll say that I yeah. did I I never seen one till this one, I, so. I think this was probably the the idea that it was the uh custom color headstock is, is interesting I, I was very much educated by Bill Holland you know Bill Holland mm-hmm. yeah. when I first moved to town he he was he was to my education, what John Abraham was in California, hipping me to stuff that they'd been obsessed with for a long time already. And um, I don't remember where, I know you said you wanted bright red. Yep, and I, yep I, I remember to, that. I went to the paint store and mixed my own paint. I went and looked <laughs> wow, through the catalogs. I, <laughs> I went through the catalogs looking for um, Fiesta Red and all that stuff. And and because there was a, there was a store in Franklin that Still had some of the old Duco colors on a shelf. They yeah. weren't using them, um, and they had the catalogs. And you could look these things up, and they still had the Fender name. Like the Fender didn't change the name when they when they took these car colors. And I looked up Fiesta Red, and I took out anything that was dark. So you know, like a lot of car colors, they look like they're bright red, but they got black in them and brown. Candy apple, you kind of yeah. Yeah, just just they mix six or seven colors and some of them are dark. And I took them out, and when I got around to your telly, I took out even more of them. I mean, it was, it was just like red and orange, and a little white, and that was it. Trying to get as bright as possible, but that's where that came from. I remember that. I remember too, Joe. That right, right there was a young guy making pickups out in California named uh, Seymour Duncan, and I met him through Chet. I was mm-hmm. working with Chet. Mm-hmm. We played Santa Barbara. I remember him. They coming out and bringing uh, uh, Paul Rivera, you know, was his game too. And mm-hmm. I met him at that time. And and uh, I remember Seymour and I hit it off. Mm-hmm. And I, I was like, oh, I want these 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 pickups, you know. And uh, and then also Paul Yandel got involved with this mm-hmm. guitar. Remember, he, he was very adamant about the Ebony. Uh, he was uh, my friend and longtime Chet guy you know that i worked my bandmate and so paul was one of those guys he was very adamant about what he saw his vision of this but i think part of that might have been i wanted some this inlay i really Mm -hmm. and i think it was partly because it would be striking more because of the visual of it wouldn't you think i don't know because you know paul paul he came he came i believe to my shop and announced that this was going to be ebony fingerboard and (laughs) i remember telling him that i had had experiences with, like the first guitar I made for Olander had an ebony fingerboard, and it it did not help the sound. And um, I'd had a couple other experiences with ebony on Telecaster, Fender stuff, and realized that it was too bright. The first, you know, one of the very first people, so Olander and Jerry Gowan were the first two guys who I built for here, and those were heavy uh, um, kind of exotic wood guitars, which was a thing then, you know. People were building with a lot of exotic woods. What year would that be? Eighty, eighty-one, probably. Mm. Um, it is the very first stuff I made here, and somehow I, I 
figured out pretty quickly that that that, that was a dead end. That that um, exotic, you know, hardwood bodies. I stumbled on this actually. I stumbled on the on. I I went to the hardware store to buy um, something to be able to 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 put together and take apart so I could test a new bender thing. And it, it turned out to be ash, and it turned out to be lightweight ash. I don't know that I did this on purpose, but it was so-called swamp ash. Mm. And I bought it in the hardware store, and I put the guitar together to test the bender, I believe. And the thing sounded so much better than what I was building. I was like, that's interesting. So I'll just finish it off. And so I painted it, and it sounded less good. And I thought, oh, man, what's that mean? I stripped it off. I mean, I had all the time in the world. I lived in this farm out in Leaper's Fork. You know, I barely made any living, but I was playing steel. So I barely made any living. And but I, So I stripped it off again. This is just crazy. And it sounded great again. So it's like, okay, mental note. Lots of finish kills the sound. And nobody knew anything about this. And then I I tried that with a harder wood body I had around. It still sounded terrible. And I and I've also with the with the fingerboards, I started to realize that the fingerboard impacted the sound. Paul and I, by then I knew it. So I tried to by this time I knew it, and I tried to talk Paul out of the yeah. ebony. He he just you know listen, Junior, you know, and, and that's the way it was. <laughs> Remember we I had a. Jumping in on you, Joe, but I remember we had a there's a brilliant artist, a lady named Diane Patrick, that did this inlay. And I, my idea was to uh, incorporate my initials, mm -hmm. but do it uh, very inconspicuously. And so she came up with this little tree of life that I love it. But if you look closely, you can see the SW right there. And uh, so anyway, and then immediately. Right as soon as you handed this to me, finished. We did a. I had a song out called "Why Goodbye," that uh, we uh, did a video on it, and videos were just starting to be coming in vogue at that time. I only, I think, in country, I'd only seen the Judds had one and somebody else. I mean, there aren't very many videos; they just weren't a thing yet in country. And we did this video. We rented the ho a hotel or a motel, I should say, yeah. in Antioch, and painted the whole front of the building. And uh, this I p did it using the video, and I got mm -hmm. so much response from it. Of course, it was real flashy, great guitar for a video, you know. So. Yeah. The uh, the matching headstock was that your idea or was that Steve's? I don't remember that. I mean, it was a thing. I don't even remember. It was some. <clears throat> it was. I mean, anybody who was a Fender fanatic, which I'm sure both of us were. Would have would want that yeah like, would, would want like that. that white base it's yeah that the matching head you know yeah. that yeah I don't know I mean at that sure either at that point Ryan Ryan I love it my son Ryan calls it the redhead you know he says hey grab that redhead he used to always when he was younger he would call it the redhead yeah I had the logo figured out by then which is basically a total rip off of a Fender logo <laughs> it's the same <laughs> that's strip. hand done too right yeah that's hand painted. Uh -huh. Which is crazy because I'd have to lay down the your your you did, your painter. You did that yourself yeah, yeah, yeah. too, right? Yeah. Wow! I, you have to lay down the, the so black precise. and then put the silver on top of yeah. it. Yeah, messed it up. Come back. I mean, neither my uh, my eyes probably aren't good enough, and my hands probably <laughs> not steady enough to do that anymore. But I did a, quite a number of guitars hand painted, and, uh, and that wasn't my first logo. So that's that's pretty early, but not. But there was a a, a completely different logo that was more angular that was preceded that. And earlier you were mentioning you had you hadn't figured out the wood thing. So tell us about the wood thing. You started looking at the neck, and uh, fairly early on, um, I I had met Paul Reed Smith, and and Paul and I were both kind of beginning to build, and he called me up one day and said. Man, for my first seven guitars or 14 guitars, I forget which it is, I'm looking for some humbucking pickups that I can rewind. He wanted to do his own wind. And because, because I knew people who knew people and stuff, I got a hold of, I hate to say this because this is probably not appropriate, but the statute of limitations are passed. But somebody had a bunch of, of rejected Gibson pickups. Maybe they were had a failed coil or something. And I stripped the, I said, oh, Paul, no problem. And I, I really, you know, I just wanted to be helpful. 
and so I found these things, stripped the stripped the wire off of them so that it would look like they were just like I had the power to get to just the the, the bobbins and stuff. And I sent them to him, and he said, "Well, okay, thank you so much. I'm going to give you my closest, mo most closely guarded secret: the wood guy." And this was for his first seven or fourteen guitar. I mean, the the number was fourteen. Whether it was for seven guitars or whether it was twenty eight for fourteen guitars, I don't remember. But his first batch, and so he turned me on to this guy who was his secret wood guy for a long time, and now is a known um, is is a known uh, guy who was his wood source. And I went up and visited that guy, and he got me to a completely different grade of. Curly maple. Very few people were using curly maple. Obviously, Gibson had in the 50s, but Phil Kubicki was, Paul was, maybe nobody else. And I was using it because because from being a, a showbud steel guitar owner, they used bird's eye and curly mm -hmm. maple, and I was fascinated by it. And so this looks like the older stuff that was that I was able to find just by going to lumber yards and looking at the stuff that they that they were throwing away because nobody wanted to use nobody wanted that stuff it wasn't you know it's too hard to work you couldn't run through a planer without it chipping out and stuff they didn't want it joe talk about these uh for a moment if you don't mind these uh little markers i don't know if you can see those but they're they're actually two pieces right but if you can see it it's a they're like a half mo or a moon but black on the bottom and Ebony and uh, I guess Mother of Pearl or whatever that is. I think top. it was some creative idea I had. I think it was based on the Harlequin mask, that half black, half white mm. Harlequin mask. Um, I love them. They're very easy to see. And as I said off camera, as I've gotten older with my eyesight, I really like them a lot now. <laughs> it wasn't easy to do. I remember. Th <laughs> but said, again, you know, I had I had my whole life to finish a guitar. It didn't occur to me that there was a connection between how long something took and and how how much food you would have com, uh, consumed in the meantime, and how broke you'd be when you were done. I mean, I, I was really a go to the grocery store guy, buy milk or yogurt, but not both. I mean, it was it was real, it was really lean for my first ten years here. Wow! But I liked the idea of doing that. I thought it would. I had never seen that. I just thought it would look cool, and I think it does look cool. In retrospect, I, I like it a lot. Would you do it again? <laughs> I won't build a guitar again. <laughs> <laughs> Next lifetime. Uh, yeah. So the answer is no. The answer is no. <laughs> How much of this was was hand like like the pit guard? Did you hand oh, yeah. make that? Okay. Absolutely. And that's celluloid, which you could get then. Absolutely all handmade. Even even the bender, you can see I made myself on the on the workbench. I mean, it looks like it was made with a hammer and a hacksaw. Um, and then had it plated. There was a place called Leonard Pl Plating, which is still here. And I would take these two or three pieces down, and they would plate. Wow! Them. Oh wow! Wow! I'm sure I made the well. I made the plate, and I punched. Well, let's see what this says. It's serial number forty three, U.S. patent number on it. So it by four. So I started at twenty nine at serial number twenty nine because I didn't want anybody to know I had was just starting. <laughs> so there was there was no one through. So you pushed in on that. Yeah. yeah. So. That maybe this was about the, if if I was accurate, this was maybe about the twelfth or fourteenth guitar I made. Period. Yeah. And that that I was putting the patent number on means that the patent had issued. Joe, did you do this? Or I don't even recall. Yeah. That's the. Do you recall? Is that like a probably for turning the neck pickup on with the bridge pickup? So I don't even recall. Can, I don't. It's. I thought you. Those are things you think you'll never forget. But uh, time does that to you, I guess. But I think it was so you could get that two pickup telly sound. But it could also have been to split to split, split these, yeah, these yeah. stacks because sure. stacks were great. The Seymour Duncan stacks were great pickups. This one is older than these, so I think this one is original because it because the the magnet is under the under the cover. Yeah. When they first came out, they had red covers. And nobody liked that. that. Yeah, I remember yeah. that. So we either, these either, I think they were probably all these. And then when these, this is probably something we swapped in later. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, it's, 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 you need, it's hilarious man. to see it. Yeah. You know, it's been a huge, it, this was a huge break for me. You know, that, that my early guys, you and Skaggs and stuff, 
absolutely put me on the map. And so, um, had that not happened, well, I, we, I think we would say that too. You, it's kind of both ways, you know. It's a, yeah. so this changed your guitar sound because all of a sudden the V bender came into your arsenal. Yep, and, and I started thinking of that when we made records, you know, and I was lucky that. I was working with the Nora Wilson and Tony Brown producing my records, and I love it that they got it, you know, because they Tony would say, you know, either he would or I would. I'm playing this solo, or you need to play this solo, and so I was thinking in terms of my songwriting. I'd been writing a lot, but I was getting a few cuts that I would write, you know. But later, I would really be cutting a lot of my stuff. But uh, at that point, I'm looking for stuff, you know. Some Fools Never Learn came along, and I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm doing a Bender solo on that and played it on this guitar. And, uh, and uh, you know, Tony was so great that he was, and Bowen, too, you know, they would say, yeah, do you go do that. You know, uh, they were pushing me to, and that wasn't always the case back in those days, you know. Let the studio, the yeah, session absolutely. guys play it, you absolutely. know. Absolutely. So you're, you're, you know, you're, you do it on the road, but let these, you know, I'm like, no, I, I really want to. Well, because this and Paul Yandel, pardon me, uh, Paul Yandel was huge on that. You know, I have to give him so much credit, my buddy Paul, because I remember him going to producers and going like, this kid needs to play his own guitar stuff, dude. Come on, you know. I heard him say that to some producers, yeah. you know. So the, the standard at that point would have been for you just to sing. Absolutely. And, and even if you did play, it'd be a situation where you sang during the tracking and then you would, and then it was a privilege for you to get to overdub mm -hmm. your solo and other guitar parts. Well, I'll say I'm, I was lucky, man. Coming coming into making records right out of the shoot, I was with Chet. You know, Chet made those first records. So right from the get-go, you know, Chet, of course, was going like, get out there. Even when I was like, whoa, you know, in front of all these great players, Chet would go, here, go play this. He yeah. he really pushed me to do it. So that's I'm lucky. It, it also came at a time when there was a new breed of player artists and even though there are people like Ronnie Millsap who did that because they had to back themselves up to some extent it was unusual and and it also wasn't traditional and so not that Nashville was union run but there was sort of the A-team kind of thing like you do what you do we do what we, we do we got this yeah, yeah. And, and we're not going to mix that and don't please don't Please don't step on us. We won't step on you. Well, but, as, as a kid coming up, Joe, for me now, from my point of view, you're talking about Stu Guitar. Now, here's my point of view on that. I came up talking about your influences with your parents. My dad had country bands and played and was a tremendous mm -hmm. musician and singer. Worked, had a regular job, but he... So I came up listening to Jerry Bird records. Mm -hmm. My dad loved Jerry Bird. Mm -hmm. Steel players. Um he had steels in our house. My dad had lap steels and pedal. When pedals came along, I remember having a, a little multi cord steel in you're our not house. Old, you're not old enough for that. I was ten. I was eight. <laughs> I was a little bitty guy. <laughs> but my dad had them. I remember seeing a multi cord steel going like, "What the hell is that thing?" You know. Remember the pedals came out the yeah, side, the side right. like a piano and. Uh, like only on the side, and but I was listening to later. You're saying James Burton, and and then all the Bob Warford we talked about. I remember hearing those LeBron Stat records and just going crazy. Oh my God, who's playing? Who is that? You know. Yeah. Well, Albert Lee, you can't you Albert can't Lee. Leave the the second generation of these, the, the sort of younger generation, and Ray Flack, who didn't play using a bender, but you wouldn't have known. Oh, he was tremendous player, man. And he was ba he that style was. I think he would agree that it was based on stuff that had happened because there were benders. Because of a bender, yeah. yeah. But, you know, there were few guys. But even peop a person like Jerry Reed, who was a tremendous instrumentalist when he became an artist. Glenn Campbell and Jerry Reed. They that's where I was going. Saw, you know, well, yeah, they, Glenn Campbell and Jerry Reed. That's I would look at that stuff and watch them and go, that's what I want to mm -hmm. do right there. I mean, look at that. I saw Glenn Campbell uh, and... My sophomore year of high school, I went to the Indiana State Fair and Jerry or Glenn Campbell. His good time hour was, but I was like, oh my God, I had great seats about 12 rows back, right in the center. And the opening act was Jerry Reed. And uh, he had Paul, Paul Yandel played with him and he had uh, Larry London played drums mm -hmm. and Steve Shaver played bass. Wow. And I remember seeing that and going like, and then a few years later, I'm playing with Paul in Chet's band. It's crazy, you know, can't make it up. Yeah. So this is the guitar that also used on Midnight Fire. Yep. 
Yeah, and I remember seeing like there's clips of the award show where you're where you're playing this guitar. <laughs> where I messed up, I think yeah. I I skidded I skidded across a couple of notes. That's on that. great that you remember. I remember that. this Music City News Awards. Yeah. I remember walking out going, "Damn it, I didn't play that one little section clean as I could." Yeah, I'd great. done it a thousand times, but That's hey, you get great. nervous when that tux sure. goes on, you know. Yeah, you were wearing a tux. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So, Joe, how, how did it affect you when people saw Steve playing this guitar? Did they figure, did people start making, I mean, because you don't have the internet or anything like that, so people have to kind of figure out what is that. They probably thought it was a Fender. Or, they had to go ask somebody. Yeah. And so they either asked you or they asked Buck yeah. or somebody. And I would always say, oh, no, this is, you know. I remember so many times bands would come up, opening bands, they would come up and be looking, going, you know, they really wanted to see this guitar you know, because I did, I was doing a lot of TV back then, and so whenever I'd do a show, it was funny watching players. Yeah. You knew who the players were, they were wanting to get up close That's to right. this. You know? It was a word-of-mouth deal. Yeah. Yeah. The ups, the downside was that 5,000 people couldn't find out in, in four minutes. You right. know? But the upside was that anybody who went to the trouble to find out was serious. This was just like playing Absolutely. anyway. Never it's like, it you, like the odds were so great against... Me, for instance, finding a steel, learning to play, figuring out who was on records, you know, all this kind of stuff. Um, the odds were stacked against you. So if you went to do it, you already had to be determined or you had to learn to be determined. So people who call me up about this, um, they already were pretty on fire, pretty on fire. And the, the upside was it, it, like I said, it put me on the map. The downside was they wanted the exact same thing, and I'm not a guy who does that. For <laughs> yeah, that was the first time. So did so did you get requests exactly. to build an oh, identical? Oh, you bet, you bet, yeah. you bet. And I wouldn't do it. I came close to building uh, the 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 red telly. Uh, uh, there's a couple of them out there that are that, you know. But right. but I I didn't want to do this, especially because of the because not because I was prejudiced against the ebony, but because the inlay was personal, the guitar was personal. I didn't right. really want to do a lot of strats because. I don't know why. Yeah, some I reason. got you. And but but yeah, people would want that, you know, and they they would want whoever's guitar over and over again. And I, when I mix these colors, I did it standing in the paint shop, a little of the, like cook like like a, a an improvising <laughs> shop, a little of this, yeah. <laughs> little of this, little of that. <laughs> and yeah. it's like when P, when Ricky played that purple guitar on Live in London, and I started getting calls about that. It's like, I can't make that purple again. So I'd go back in there and I'd mix it. And God knows what they look like side by side, you know, but I didn't want to do it. So, yeah, I wasn't interested in, in making the same guitar. Yeah. I always love Ricky and I. We've I remember laying these guitars together and looking at them both, the, the telly and the, his purple. They kind of came out of the same batch mm -hmm. of wood and something, didn't they, Joe, probably? They certainly at the— at, They were at brothers kind of like They were they? early brothers at the point that I had learned how do you really get a— a uh, decent sound like you can see that the finish on this wasn't very thick this is the hullet um he he didn't consciously i mean he didn't specifically say make the finish thinner but when i was looking at what he and a few other people considered to be great guitars there was not much finish on it and even though they weren't relics they were built to look like like be ready to be worn and torn and so this this and ricky's guitar and two or three others were the very maybe this and ricky's were probably the first of those Thin finished um, uh, real instruments. Yeah. Ryan, I keep mentioning him, my son Ryan, but he he knows more about the, my stuff than I do, so I always mm -hmm. defer to him. But but he he had a good point too. My telly actually, I always had people say your telly is less telly than it's more strat than telly because I played kind of that. We had a five way kind of, uh -huh. I kind of played it uh -huh. in a strat ish sound. Uh -huh. And Ryan pointed out, he goes, Yeah, because you're a strat guy. You know, he uh -huh. goes, Even you've been playing a strat for so many years when you go to that telly. I didn't play on the back bridge pickup a ton. You know, uh -huh. I did some, but mostly was the kind of in between the middle and back. Well, that was a, you know, strats were a dominant part of the country music, you know, Nashville in a way. This is beautiful about Nashville, but also a little bit of the dark side. Nashville always wants to be what it's not. It wants to be what somebody else is, which is the way we all are. And even when I moved here in 79, it was trying to be pop. Oh, yeah. And the players were trying to they be pop. They were chasing it. They were chasing it. And they had lost affection for, oh, we all want to be something, you know. 
But instead of the, and maybe it's arguable that the telly never was a big part of Nashville Sound. That it was more Bakersfield. Yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely. But when I moved here, it was about three thirty fives, and it was about Strats through a heavy chorus, the Pete Wade kind of thing, and that Strat sound was really important. And I stumbled on the idea, on the fact that Chet had something to do with this. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't know him very well, but but um, at one point, I took a Dan Electro and put the middle pickup on rails because I was trying to, I don't know what I was trying to figure out. I, I But I realized that if you put a bridge pickup in and you put the middle, that, that where the pickup was, I realized that where the pickup was had everything to do with how it sounded. And I called Seymour and he said, well, it's got a lot to do with the, you know, the strap pickups. We remagnetize the blah 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 and and um because i was trying to figure out what that sound was yeah and i re and i'm you know you're never the first person who knows something there's some guy in sri lanka who stumbled on this before i did you know or, or you know on mars but so i took this pickup and i moved it trying to figure out i think it was because i think it was when i started to do um I don't know what, why it was, but I moved the middle pickup, and I noticed it sounded radically different as it got that, that when it got to the neck position, it sounded like a neck pickup, and when it was in the middle position, it sounded like a middle pickup. It's like, who knew? And Chet, I had this Dan Electro I was messing around with. Chet, for some reason, I think it was at Corner Music, was in and looked at it and said, "Oh, well, that's there's something I want to do." I want a I want a guitar where I can move that pickup around because he already knew he knew you know of course he knew you know and he dicked around with enough of his he guitars. wanted to be like a sliding he thing. wanted to be able to put the sound where oh, he wanted to put it yeah. and so I made a guitar that had these rails I don't know what ever happened to it um, where you could slide oh. either one or two pickups and that immediately led me to the idea that you could put the middle pickup and get the Strat sound put it in a telly and Sid Hudson who I don't know if you remember I him. Do. But he was, he was, I think, the first guy who came to me and said, I want one guitar. I can go to these club gigs. I can get the, the Strat sound that everybody is living on. But I can put a humbucker in the neck. Then, then I don't have to take my 335. And then let's build it around a telly because there's some stuff where a telly is, is important. Smart. And so I built this three pickup telly. And again, somewhere, I think McAdam had built one. You know, people have done this, but nobody had a thing. You know, it was not a thing. And it quickly became a thing in Nashville. And Sid Hudson and then Brent Mason. Mm -hmm. And so figuring out that the middle pickup gave that sound, it then became a big challenge to try to, because the back pickup is at a different angle on a telly Mm -hmm. than the Strat. It's a different relationship to the bridge. How do you optimize that? And so figuring out, that had a lot to do with figuring out that these stacks were, were, had a rich two pickup Strat sound. So all that stuff evolved together. based on trying to make a Telecaster have a believable Strat yeah. sound. And you were the great Petri dish for this because it was a big part of your sound mm-hmm. and getting that to where it was convincing. Um, by the time I made the red guitar, I was really focusing on what do you have to do with the pickup? Because the back pickup's in a metal plate, so you can't really change that. What do you have to do with the, the middle pickup? And there's a tiny little zone where it sounds great. And certain pickups in the stacks I stumbled on the fact that even though this is two coils, it's a it's a humbucker. They built it as a humbucker so it would can't hum cancel. That the lower pickup being further away from the strings is weak and muddy, which is okay as a system, but it didn't it didn't sound. It it, it kept the middle pickup from sounding as great as it could, and so we quickly um, just abandon the use of the bottom pickup and the hum canceling in order to use just the top coil as that combination and to this day it's the best mm. it still is it's just accidental so all that stuff was evolving blah 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 talking about chat with the strata i'll tell you a quickie uh, a very daunting task that i had once i i produced a record called uh, no more mr nice guy it was the first oh, yeah, yeah, all yeah, guitar yeah. record that i produced i had to really talk my label into doing it they really didn't want me to do it but Anyway, I had a lot of guests on it from Larry Carlton to Chad and a lot of my pals and friends. And 
Vince came and played. And so, but I went over, I, Chet was going to play on this tune I wrote called Big Hero, Little Hero, and uh, which I wrote about Chet, you know. There was a guy in Atlanta, a friend of, a guy I used to call, when I played in the band, he called Chet Big Hero and me Little Hero. So I kind of wrote it with that. And uh, so anyway, I go over Chet's, the, my idea in my mind was to for Chet to play his Del Vecchio. I heard this on this particular song. So I walk in, and Chet's all ready to go. I go in with my engineer, Randy Gardner. And I look through the window, and Chet's got a white Strat in his hands. And he was playing a Strat. And I'm thinking, I don't want Chet playing a Strat. You know, <laughs> How do I say this and get that Strat out of his hands and get it? To get him on the Del Vecchio, but you just don't associate mm -hmm. Chet sound with a Strat, do you? I mean, you just don't was think that, of that. Was that his friendship with Knopfler that maybe put probably, that in his... probably? Mm -hmm. I played on that record with Knopfler. I played bass mm -hmm. on uh, three or four tracks, I think, mm -hmm. and it was quite an experience, you know, working uh, playing on that stuff. I wow. think. Uh, but anyway, yeah, I think might have been he was. Uh, Cat maybe have had Strat on his brain, and he know. was so open-minded. Absolutely, he was just one of these guys who was, you could say, tinkering, but he was constantly looking for. Oh yeah, that that other little thing would try anything mm -hmm. too. You know, Pat Bergerson told me that uh, you know Pat had one of those little plastic Boss pedal boards full mm -hmm. of pedals, and that when he started playing with Chet, the first thing Chet did was take take notes on what pedals he had, and he bought all the same pedals mm -hmm. just to check them yeah. out and see mm -hmm. if it was something that would work for him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was very, you're right, he was very curious, very interested in everything and aware of everything. Anything you had, he was checking it out and was mm -hmm. very curious and very aware. Even something like the Del Vecchio, um, you know, which is a, uh, it's a resonator that was, you know, it's a Brazilian-made resonator. They weren't particularly not well made, right? No, I mean, not not particularly, but they had a certain sound. I mean, he found that he found a sound for it. Um, I think he was really the first person that influenced everybody else to get them. Absolutely. One thing about the fingerboard on this is that Chet had the Del Vecchios. I think these guys in the Del Vecchio factory were sitting on the floor putting fret slots in wherever they. Thought the next one ought to be, you know. <laughs> that looks good. <laughs> <laughs> and they're so the frets are so random, and probably nobody ever noticed this until it got here. And tuning was an issue. And the Chets, I don't know who did the first one. I, um, but he, but Paul had the fingerboards replaced with this ebony fingerboard. Um, and I remember at some point when I. One of the times I got to hang out with Chet, Chet handed me his Del Vecchio and said, you put this fingerboard on. And I said, I don't think I, I didn't. Thanks, but I didn't. And I think Jerry Jones did to yeah. correct the fret placement because it was a problem. We did move, and I know I didn't do it because what we would do is just fill the slots and put the frets where they ought to be because of the sound impact of Ebony. And so... Part of my whole prejudice against ebony on instruments isn't that ebony doesn't sound good. It just changes the sound. Yeah. And you get what you get. And if you want to keep a guitar, an instrument sounding the same, or if you're building an instrument, you think, oh, like in my early days, it's like, what's an in perfect instrument? Curly maple neck, nice thick piece of ebony, uh, blah, blah, blah. You know, if you're menu building an instrument, you're not likely to get something predictable. You're going to get some combination of things you know instruments just are what they are and something that worked on a les paul or worked on a on a d'angelica won't work on a won't work on a, a 335 or a les paul uh, every little bit makes a big difference do you uh, know the story of the del vecchio just briefly the no. where chet got the no. del vecchio uh -uh. He befriended Los Indios Tabaharis. Oh, yeah, 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 that's right. Do you know the story? I guess Zach, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, yeah. And I met Nato Lima once. I met mm -hmm. him with Chet. Brilliant. He were brilliant composers mm -hmm. and from the rainforest. I mean, totally played these classical players that came out of the rainforest of Brazil and just they would they were on Carson a lot. They would be mm -hmm. on Johnny Carson mm -hmm. and. But they were brilliant classical players, composers. Nato, I think he's the one that wrote uh, Blue Angel. And uh, but anyway, that's and right. so I think Chad had been around those guys right, and right, recorded right. with them, and that's mm -hmm. that's where he kind of latched onto the Del Vecchio. 
One last thing on this guitar before we uh, move on to the to the uh, the the red bender. Uh, what is the body wood on this? Let's look at the back. <laughs> Fortunately, you've worn enough off. That's a, that's alder. Okay. That's alder. So alder, because yeah, you can see. <laughs> Yeah. You know, one thing I loved about your use of these guitars is that you beat the crap out of them. And <laughs> yes. you didn't care. I threw them. Yeah. It doesn't matter. That was so because people are so <laughs> precious about stuff. You know, you you excavated your way through to the, the oh front side God. on the telly. Oh. And that's such that was such an honor as opposed to this thing of trying to keep it's a something worship rent. thing. Yeah. But that red the telly, I remember we my my guitar tech, Tommy Webb, mm -hmm. his dad drove bus for me, uh her, Curtis. We called him Don't Hurt Us, Curtis. <laughs> and uh, but Tommy, one of my dear friends, he we got into this thing where at every night I would toss my telly to him. I'd throw it to him. I know people do that, but it was just kind of, a, it became, I did it one night and then he kind of, it became a thing. And so every night I would toss it and he would, I started backing up every night just a little bit <laughs> and just, see, and then just see how he would chase it. And it got to be where finally I had to, he, we came, he came to me. We just go, we got to quit. Yeah. Cause we did it for eight months where I would throw it from here to that wall. I'd take the strap and I would, the band's playing the chaser off the, and I would take it. It had a wireless and everything. I'd just take it and throw it. I had it down though where I could, I threw it where it went up. And when it came down, he just caught it like that. And he was a real athletic kid, you know, but uh, it, it finally we go, you know, I better not be doing that anymore. If something happened to this thing, I don't even have a backup, you know. You so. know, speaking of the lot, the, your live thing, and when I went out on, took a, this little three-day road trip with you guys to Fort Worth or wherever it was, in some, the, the first gig, I sort of wandered around out in the audience. You guys did the coolest, most sophisticated thing you were singing, I forget what song it was, but at one point while singing it, you would just kind of turn away in the middle of your of, of the lyric, turn away from the, the mic and look, you know, at something else. And the your vocal would go on would go Kept on going. completely. Yeah. And and I was like, this guy's singing the tracks. What? You know, and it was <laughs> you and your brother who My was playing brother. drums. <laughs> <laughs> who sound exactly the same? You had this. I don't, where this g came from is probably like your t your teenage years playing in your dad's band. Yeah, we had it down, man. Too. It was, and and so I thought, did I just see that, or am I am, am I having a, 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 a am I losing it? And um, I watched and watched, and you go quite a while, <laughs> oh, yeah. quite a while oh, yeah. through the set, and then you did it again. It's like, okay, I saw that. That's you see Terry. now, that's Terry. I'm giving it away. <laughs> we almost did it like a ventriloquist where I would go. Lots of times, uh, yeah. <laughs> lonely. You know that he would, he would, we, we would do it. We had it down. We it had was, it down to every little section. We had it down. I did it. <laughs> but but it was it was aimed at only Eve the most Terry. most perceptive person in the audience. Kind of kind of like you'd go to a gig and you're listening to, wow the 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 bass drum has a certain you know it's like for these <laughs> these geeks who are who are actually who know what the hell is going on in the first place because most people go and they don't know when the band's in tune if it's in time you know whether the players are any good and this was so aimed at that 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 tiny slice of people it yeah. was for us as much as them you know <laughs> that was incredible oh that's funny. <laughs> With look the at red this guy, tie. yeah. <laughs> so th this has been kind of your constant companion since you got it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. It, it's hard to think of a you know. There's not that many performances where you don't have this guitar. Yeah, if I'm, I, oh yeah, no question. But boy, look how the how pronounced that's become over the years. That beautiful wood. I mean, that stripe. Yeah. We were talking about that the the era of. The neckwood in the strat and this and this is this is the post, um, Paul Reed Smith, 
conversation. Wood Waker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wood, wood source. And you know, Ricky's purple guy looks, they're so similar. It's, it is the same tree, I believe. Yeah, they're, they're, they're not, when I see his, I just go, oh my God, that's that's mine. You know, I so. drove up to New England to, to go get wood, and we would go to these little mills, and they were cutting maple, and they were taking the curly stuff and throwing it to the side to use to, to chip, I suppose, because nobody wanted it again. Mm -hmm. And we went through these piles. I didn't, at this point, really still understand the hardness, stiffness, um, significance in necks. That the that, that the 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 mass and the and the the stiffness, the elastic, the modulus elasticity had a lot to do with the sound. Um, so I bought a lot of different curly maple, and it wasn't until I came back down here and started building with it that I realized that some necks sounded much better than others. And there was this one, but but I was smart enough, I was I was lucky enough that when I was buying it, I would take a magic marker and write on, on the end of the boards what came from a particular thing. We, we sat at this mill and picked up all this wood and this particular tree, I, I had a red magic marker and I wrote, I think the date on it. And this turned out to be just the, the magic sounding neck wood of, of any of that batch I got. Did it come Vermont, Vermont, or do you remember where? Mon where Moncton, Maryland. Moncton, yeah, Maryland. So what was it that made these special as far as the, you're talking about the, the mass and the flexibility and all that? Well, you know, we were, you know, like I said earlier, the, the type of finish, the thickness of the finish, the weight of the body, um, all every single one of these things affects the sound of a guitar, whether it's a single or a double truss rod. I mean, I always used single truss rods like Fender, uh, a curved truss rod, and tried to make it so that when it was finished that it was tight. You know, I, I would build bow into the neck so I could tighten it up because it affects the sound. And um, <clears throat> some of it unpredictably, but – and certainly the body – the body wood. This is basswood, by the way, which um, I didn't use a lot, but I think I was experimenting with. But all that stuff has a lot to do with the sound of an instrument. And some of it's a mysterious combination of things, but but some of it's fairly predictable. So how did this guitar come about? So You know what, Joe, if you remember, if I'm not mistaken, this guitar you started making in 86, mm -hmm. and the guys in the band all got together and said, let's have this guitar made for Steve. That's really how it started. Because I think I maybe had, they may have heard me on the road, on the bus. They may have heard me saying, like, I think I'm going to have a telly made. Or they may have heard me, in my mind, I'm thinking they may have heard me say something. And I think behind my back, they all went to you and said, let's make a telly. Well, at some point, obviously, I got to be involved because the color and the specs of it. And then I was. But I think that's where the, the impetus was the band got this for me. Yeah, and I used to I used to get together with whoever I was building for, and go over neck shape because I was hand shaping these things. Mm -hmm. Actually, on the bottom side of a belt sander, this is the most dangerous, crazy thing. But I would take the neck and I would, you know, a belt sander goes around like that, and the top of it's on a flat plate, a platen is what it's called, and the bo bottom's just this flapping piece of sanding belt going by at 40 miles an hour. <laughs> and I would reach my hand under and use it as a stroke sander and shape the neck. Yeah, yeah, and um. And love try to it, do it, it around something that either a neck you showed me that you liked or something. Somehow we came, and then I would make a little template. So this may have been a copy of the of the neck on yeah, that. Yeah, and I, I remember that discussion, but I don't remember where it came from. But it, I remember that it was like, oh yeah, that's what I want. You know, the the curvature, and I don't know if there's another telly I had or something. You might have you might have showed me something in the first place. And this isn't right. a real de decal at this point. That's Yeah, a, you've uh, gone to a decal. Yeah. And yeah. And did you have templates to for the headstock shape? Did oh, you I made templates from all yeah. the stuff, yeah. yeah. And what was it based on? Was it based on vintage instruments that you it had? It was probably based on um uh it could have been based on Bill Hollett's guitar because I took that apart at one point, um, uh, weighed the body and the neck. Yeah. At a certain point I realized that Building at random didn't get you anywhere, and that, that the body weight mattered. Again, nobody knew this stuff. Nobody knew any of this right. stuff. And I started weighing the great sounding guitars, and then weighing the body and the neck, and tapping on them, and listening to what their resonant frequency was. I realized that certain combinations sounded superior. That, and about that, about the time I really dialed it in, 
I quit building, which would have been the, the early 90s. But there was absolutely a, an important correlation there. And so um, the at, at the point when I was studying that, I took Hullet's guitar apart with his knowledge, weighed it all, and, and other ones, and, and made the templates as, as as faithful to Fenders as possible. Um, on this one, it doesn't have this little lip. For some reason on the Strats, the early ones, I put a lip on that side of the, the neck that Fender didn't put on. I don't know what I th was thinking, but this became much more faithful to uh, the, the Fender. At some point, you started doing these a little not less uh, wide than a tally, right? I mean, this is not as thick as a tally. Yeah, and the reason is um, because it was hard to get the wood of, you know, to buy alder or. Um, Basswood, I could get it in three quarter thickness and oh, glue it gotcha. together, yeah. or whatever it was. But also, I was building the bender into these. Um, I later figured out how to how to drill a hole through them without doing this. But the, the early ones, I built them in, and so the, it's a it's a top and a bottom, it's a front and a back glued together. Glued, yeah, and and that's be, and that's why when glued three quarter and three quarter, it didn't add up to one and three quarters, which is what a fender is. So. So as much as I'd like to claim that I did it on purpose, I did it because there were no there was no choice. Sure. So this has a seam like mid body. Yeah, there's there's a seam in there mid body. Yeah. Yeah. The binding is that I don't recall is that me idea or the you idea? I've always loved the single me front binding. Me too. I think we talked about this. Me we, too. We, I always I couldn't remember, but uh, I'm so glad we did it on this guitar though. That white uh -huh. binding, you know. I thought you know I've I've I love the Fender. Um, I mean, I'm, early on, I realized how classic and beautiful the the Fender stuff up was up through the mid '60s. I mean, as time went on, we allow later and later stuff. But my first instrument I put a Bender in, which I ended up with, was a '67 Tele. I always put the wall in there, and after that, like, who cares? Or '68, you know, who cares? Before that, everything was was uh, some sort of religious icon and I love the customs Me that too. Fender did. They did binding. I don't know if they ever did a single a single front only binding, but I love that that idea. And so I built a number of guitars like this. And I think you and I talked about this. I think we did this. too. We both flipped I mean we were mm -hmm. both had a crush on it. <laughs> you know the interesting thing is for me, I tell people this and they can't it it freaks people out really a little bit. But I never owned a guitar till I was uh, till sophomore in high school. I never owned a guitar. Uh, having played my dad's, you know, he had a jazz master, so mm -hmm. I was always a real Fender guy. I played a jazz master, and pretended in my mind that it was a telly, you know. I'd play all those Roy Nichols licks and and Burton licks, acting in my brain I was playing a telly, you know. Why did you use, uh, you know, Cluson type machine heads? You yeah, know, Joe. <laughs> Early on, again, I was under the influence of the fact that everything newer was better. Like the first few guitars had showers and stuff. Maybe that does. Yes. I think yeah, it Paul, does. Yeah, yeah. I think Paul prescribed showers for that. I think so, too. But fairly quickly, again, I learned that by retrofitting tuners, and here's the guitar, and then we put on these nice, these better tuners, and suddenly there was something wrong with the guitar. And... um. I, I never, I, I've always believed that less is better and you don't change something unless there's a really good reason. Um, but it started to become apparent. You know, somebody bring a guitar and they go, I want Grovers or Shallers on this. We, we play it ahead of time. I'm like the worst guitar player in the world, but I can hear what oh, yeah. instruments sound like. And I'd play the thing. And say, this is a great sounding guitar. And we'd put Shallers on somebody's guitar. It's like, Wow. We shouldn't have done that. Mm -hmm. And then you, you can't really necessarily tell people. So pretty quickly we were recommending, or I was, I guess I was working mostly by myself. It's like, if you, you know, very few problems with, with tuning comes from the tuners. In fact, in, in reality, tuners have to be incredibly bad. As long as you're tuning up from below the note, they have to be incredibly bad to affect the, the, the ability of a guitar to stay in tune. And so it's usually the nut. It's yeah, it's the nut, job. you know, or if you tune down, then you know they'll, the slack, the gear lash will kick in. But I think early on, and again from my influence with the hanging out with people who were who appreciated 
the wonder of the 50s and early 60s guitars it was, it was so obvious you know go to go to Cluzon there's there's an, and the curved truss rod that just the whole thing Fender may have accidentally got that right but since we were all um, we built our lives on that and our sound and our concept of what's great it was important your departure you know because you know this is very vintage inspired mm-hmm. you know where the departure comes in the third pickup and then in the bridge. So you used this this uh, you know Goto you know, or Schecter Goto TC three hundred one yeah <laughs> I, you know I don't remember my phone number but I you like, like anybody with <laughs> advancing dementia I remember the name of that. <laughs> the third pickup we already talked about was driven right, right. by Sid Hudson and you know it, it became that thing that I was blatantly co- copying Fender but then at a certain point Fender copied us and had invented the the Nashville Telly right. 10 years into this. And I remember you coming to me with the idea that PV wanted to build you a red guitar and put a bender in it. Mm-hmm. And I remember thinking, oh, I'm not going to, which was the stupidest thing in the world. I should have done it because, <laughs> you know, and, and I, we sort of talked. To they them. did, PV did build me some guitars. Yeah. But, but I, now, now in a, OEM or a company or certainly Fender is building the Brent Mason model with benders in it. We jump at that opportunity to provide that or secrets or the whatever. Timing is so yeah. terrible. Oh, who knew? <laughs> who knew? But it, but it's funny the fact that that I was just blatantly ripping Fender, and they never they never came after me at all. Which whereas later they went after all these people. And one reason they is never that, did, huh? No, because because when tell. This stuff was not getting used very much in Nashville. You know, tellies were, there were a f- small handful of people. And then the, the group grew and a lot of the stuff was custom stuff. Yeah. And the reason they didn't come after anybody is if somebody saw you on stage from more than five rows back, that's a Fender. So these were yeah, selling they Fenders. Yeah, they did. Yeah. They, they weren't selling my guitars. These were selling Fenders. Yeah, yeah that's a good point. Yeah. Makes sense. So why did you use the uh, the Goto bridge instead of a uh, you know the old style bridge? Again, it was it was the um, it was driven by the idea that there were better things, and particularly intonation. And even though people had bent the the, the tele saddle to to get it in tune, and you and it's actually I don't like this bridge. I'm, I'm not fond of it. I don't think it sounds as good or is as, as stable. But it was it was an '80s thing, and it became a thing. And then everybody wanted it. We tried it on something, and everybody wanted it for the mistaken um, concept that you can only really tune with six saddles, and it's that that's better. And I, I regret it because today people put this thing on a pedestal. They put the six saddle telly on a pedestal, whereas the brass saddle, the three brass saddle thing, it's got better downward tension because it's got two strings pushing two screws into the into the um, uh, plate. You know, there's much more force. It's a better material. I apologize. I apologize for the six saddle yeah. to go to bridge. <laughs> How, however, it, they do, they do have a sound, and and obviously, you know, Steve and Ricky and and Brent Mason and and tons of people, you know, still have that bridge on their old guitars that you modified, and they sound great. Well, because and also again, I mean, this is basswood, which I I, I didn't I wasn't in love with the sound of basswood, but we used it to figure out, you know, because you had to. Unfortunately, you were a guinea pig. I don't know how we got there. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Hey, I was say I was with you, man. We were we were two like two kids, just hey, let's try this. You know, I was so excited to see what you would do, like watching you paint. You know, it's like I was so. I remember, you know, we were feeling our way through this stuff. I was couldn't wait to get my hands on and see what you had done. You know, and, well, my side of it was I remember telling the guys in your band. I'll use this experimental wood on this guy. He won't know the difference. <laughs> no, I don't. Know. I don't know where basswood came from, except that it was light, and I don't know why. I didn't make very many. I probably made ten or fifteen guitars out of basswood. Some of it sounded really good, but again, it's all the combination. So right. it's like maybe this wood and this bridge work together. Right. But this, I, I'm just not terribly fond of the bridge, and I feel guilty about it. But again, a guitar is is composite of its of its um, 
parts. And, and mm-hmm. you can't say that a brass saddle, three brass saddle bridge would make this guitar sound better. It might, right. and it might not at all. Right. So. How did you feel when, uh, you know, like seeing, you know, Skaggs and Steve, you know, on stage together, like on the CMA Awards when they did Restless and seeing the two of them together <laughs> playing their matching oh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. benders. <laughs> was was that a, a, a nice feeling? Two Glazer brother guitars yes. out there. Dude, you can't imagine. You can't imagine what the, what the, because here's the other thing. Okay. All, when I was a little kid, I remember my, I have a younger brother, a year younger gifted musician who went and got a real job, worked for the airlines all his life. But he was, he could do, he could, he was a great musician. In fact, one, we played in a band together and I remember him sitting down at my steel. He was playing bass in the band. I remember him sitting down at my steel and going, no, 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 that's not how you get the sound. And he took the steel bar like this, you know, not this kind of, and he held it like that. And within 10 seconds, he had better tone than me. You know, he was like, he was, hate that guy. Yeah. Here's, here's how you slide, you know. And, and, but he, he would lay down, he was a Beach Boys nut in the very beginning. And he put the speakers, he'd lay on the floor and, and put the speakers there and go, listen to that bass. And I'd lay down and go, yeah. And I couldn't even pick the bass out. I mean, it just wasn't. He just had that thing. That like he, you. Yeah, like probably yeah. as a, as a you know, five, six-year-old, you already were listening to parts of the music. That, yeah, separating and yeah. stuff. Yeah. So my brother, this is where this comes in. I remember sitting in, laying in our room as little kids, and he had the Fender catalog. This was probably, we were probably 13 and 14 years old or 9 and 10. And he had the Fender catalog from whatever year it was where they had those Wildwood, you know, the, the colored instruments. My uncle had a Wildwood. You know, they yeah. put this... This paint in, yes. the, in the tree when it's growing, I think. Yeah. Maybe, maybe, right. yeah, because it yeah. went into certain grain and not other mm-hmm. grain. And I remember looking at that, and there was a picture of the steel. And I remember thinking, whatever that thing is, I'd already heard it. You know, it's like, that, that's, that's what I want. All I ever wanted was to be somehow involved. And I ruled yeah. out being a musician because, or being a significant musician, because I realized I wasn't going to be. So to watch... These guys on stage and be in the mm-hmm. in the game today. This is still all. I mean, this is still like you know the pinch me moment. Is is I got to do something useful. Yeah, it was. It, yeah, it was incredible. Joe, honor. you definitely got involved. I'll say that much. Well, you know, geez, man. But I'm lucky because if you'd been a guitar repairman and you'd been a guitar repairman and the other 3,560 people here who play guitar were repairmen, I would be like in the lower 35% <laughs> skill. I, <don't> <laughs> I don't think he's okay. accurate. <laughs> yeah, I don't believe that at all, Joe. Joe, you're funny. The yeah. fact that there's 11 <laughs> guitar repairmen in, in Nashville or, or builders or something, is it's much better odds. So I did luck out. Yeah, man. I feel like we need to, uh, so again, this guitar has been just incredibly significant in, in your career. It's kind of become, you know, part of your, uh, your, your look and your persona. People just kind of expect to see this red guitar. And let's see, you've got, you know, three pickups. It originally had the, uh, the, the blade Seymour Duncan in the middle, but since then you've, you've replaced them with, uh, Ron Ellis pickups. Ron Ellis, yeah. And that was because of your son, Ryan. Yeah. He, I've, I played his, uh, he had them in a guitar, and I flipped over them and really loved yeah. them. And then I had Ron make me these. I still I love my Seymour Duncans. Still have the original ones right in there, I, yeah. you know. But uh, what, I did, like, what did it do for the sound? Tell me how how do you hear it? How do you hear it? Well, I I think it was I was I was recording some things, and I was wanting a more of a real more spanky, real telly, straight out of real telly mm-hmm. kind of sound, more original, you know. And I think that's what I was kind of going for. But I'm, you know, talking about being open, you know, with mm-hmm. Chad. I, man, I'm open to try. I, I can how, always put a pop them right back in. How know? did this, it, does this have a good, good second position? Yeah, it does. I really like the second. Mm-hmm. I, I do more stuff for that second position mm-hmm. probably anywhere. anywhere. And, and these sound good? Yep, that? very very much he makes he makes incredible yeah i'm really pleased and uh although i do love my duncans too but uh this is this is what i think is best <laughs> yes tell us tell us about the back <laughs> well belt buckles you know playing in texas oklahoma wearing those big belt buckles in the day i remember coming into your shop kevin marks my sound engineer years ago he used to put uh, and tommy i talked about my guitar tech they used to put 
black tape on it, cover it up because I would always gripe and I go, man, I'm getting I'm getting chips all in my Manuel coats here, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'd have little splinters and stuff from acting like a fool during the show and getting splinters everywhere. And so uh, they put a piece of black tape, and that's still some of the black tape adhesive adhesive i guess and so i remember one day long time ago i came in you set this down and you turned it over and you saw the black tape and you just go <laughs> and ripped it off and i go oh okay that tape's off now you yeah know? so and really? you, you made a comment i apologize no i love it I, and i loved it though because you you go man that's too cool to, and i was with you you were saying you know you were like hey that's part of it you know and i we were laughing about it actually it was a but it's, you know, it's, uh, that's just, those are uh, battle scars, you know. So that, that's, it's battle scars, yeah. you know. So, so uh, and I, and I, I don't know if you want to jump to it now, but uh, it got to a point when I was flying a lot and I really didn't want to take this guitar flying it so much and everything. I just hated to do it. And I was afraid I'd get out and something happened to it. Well, I wanted to have a backup. In case I wanted to fly this instead of this, and so I had our friend, your our mutual friend, your friend and mm -hmm. mine, Jeff Sin, mm -hmm. made me a backup for it. And I know you've seen this guitar, <laughs> but it's so hilarious, isn't it? It's like and I've only had this a few years, a couple of years, I think. But he did such a great job. He even went the, to such the shape detail. of the knobs, everything. He got everything. If you can see right. this up close, even the back, it's like ridiculous how he <laughs> how he went so far. As to, he did this. He, he studied. <laughs> he studied this. He's really an artist, and yeah. I mean, you guys both, you're just artists. That's but to do that, and so sometimes I'll. Uh, if I'm flying and stuff, I, and I'll take that one and just not chance this one, you know. So. He really got the color close. Pretty, pretty that, close. That's yeah. the first thing that shocked me was how cl how close pretty the shades close. were. Yeah, it's slightly oranger, but it's yeah. but it's it's incredibly yeah, close. Just really, really a piece of art. Both are just art. And so sometimes I'll fly if I'm flying or whatever. I'll take that one instead. And I just I don't like chancing this one anymore. So and he even kind of imitated <laughs> the <laughs> logo. He so did. It's, a no, it's so bender. great. It looks like the same spaghetti. That's yours. so wonderful. It's so great. Yeah. What a it's what a really tribute. A, it is. It's it's really a tribute. Um, know, so even even to these little, if you look, Zach, you know, even to these little. These little places are all. Yeah. <laughs> Whether it's an appropriate moment or not, would you hold those two things? Up? Heck yeah, it's always an appropriate I, I, moment. I've wanted to get this photo for a while. <laughs> we should do wow. one of us too. Isn't that great? Yeah. And my guitar tech, one day he brought out. He on during the show he whispers he goes, "Do you know which guitar?" He took <laughs> he took it away and boy, I went to an acoustic and he as he's leaving he goes, "Do you know which one that was?" And I go, "No, I don't have a clue." <laughs> Cuz it really fe do, they feel very do they sound similar? Yeah, very much so. They really feel similar too. Yeah, that's just it's ridiculous, marvelous. isn't it? Mm -hmm. That's really incredible. It's, he's really an artist, man. <clears throat> and then you uh you did the B bender. Yeah, it's, it's so. the modern. It's the most modern bender. Yep. And then we and got these, we got it down to that place, and then Joe you, Joe put the B. Are these Ron Ellis pickups too? Yeah, yeah, they're the same. The Ellis. <laughs> it's crazy. He's got. I mean, the Ron Ellis pickups are so great. They are. Yeah, they're pretty badass. Yeah. So but, uh, so Joe, you. Uh, the the benders used to take a long time to get an install. I remember, mm -hmm. you know, of course, mm -hmm. getting them back in the in the nineties and such, and there was there was quite a wait. But the, with the redesigned bender, which this one has, people, you know, there's a pretty quick you know turnaround. You know, and they can uh, they can they can go online and they can get on on a uh, you know they can schedule their bender and send it off to you, and they can they can get it pretty quick now. Yeah, well, you know, I never felt proud of the fact that it took us. Months, yeah. Um, partly it was because I, I had a guy who who was doing the bender stuff, and and he spent a fair amount of time. He he was part time, and he was, but he was also innovating. You know, he spent a lot of time designing and stuff. And but we we didn't we didn't turn them out 
very rapidly, and they had to they had to be hand done the whole thing. And so, in 2018, um, and partly partly because at about that time, Brad Paisley had a Fender model coming out, and he and he called me and asked me if I would be interested in doing a Bender for it. And I said, yeah, and I and I began thinking that very quickly I needed something that could be installed quickly, that, that easily and and rapidly. And so I, in 2018, I redesigned it. And the whole goal was to um, deal with the, the issues, which were that, A, it would have to be mass produced so that we weren't sitting there cutting pieces of metal all day long. B, that it needed to drop in quickly. Um, it needed to be B or G convertible because of Brad and Olander and, and Jeff King, who, uh, you know, they play a G down. They do d- double pools. Yeah. Well, the, Olander does a double, but but Brad and Jeff King do the G. And I also wanted to be um, uh, to have throw options because a lot of the early guys playing the, Pars- the, the Parsons, Parsons White or Gene Parsons benders, that's a, a long longer throw. Oh, yeah, so I wanted sure. something that could be short for someone like Brad. And so I redesigned it. And um, uh, the good thing is, is that you know, it takes about a little over an hour to put it in, and uh, actually two minutes to install it, but but an hour to do you know take the guitar apart and do all that stuff. So that that took the time frame out of it, and made it much more adjustable, and made it so that other companies could do it. So yeah, it it was a total transformation over the the days of having to tell people for months on end that their guitar wasn't ready yet. Yeah. <laughs> I, remember. I, I apologize. That, I, I apologize for that too. And I know that feeling. Yes. <laughs> well, it's like a kid at Christmas. You're like, oh my gosh, I can't wait yeah. to get it. You know. Well, you guys always got priority. I, I think I may have done more than one. I think I did another bender for you and something else at some point. But yeah, you did. You've done. It. I got. I think I have um, three or four of yours. Only only these two red ones, but mm-hmm. I do have a couple others. So. The local. The local actual players. I mean, I've always felt like you you have to tip to the to the people who are making a living. Yeah. And so that was always much faster. But um, now yes. it's now it's and people would call up and go, you have to be somebody to get one of these things, don't you? And I go, no, no, we're just we're just slow. But now I feel like we're making it up to people because it's a one day, three day, four day turnaround. And, right. And that's. You know, if I do this another fifty or sixty years, I might have made up for all the all the time of making people well, wait. I even hear of people, you know, scheduling it to where they'll have the bender done and they fly in or drive into Nashville and they and they pick it up from the shop. Or drive wow. in yeah, that's yeah. cool. Drive in the morning, pick it up in the afternoon. You know, as yeah. long as they let us know, we can do that. I, yeah. I want to do that. You know, I wanna be I want them to be treated the way I'd want to be treated, which is that if yeah. something's important to yeah. them, it's important to us. And, you know, of course, you have all, all sorts of, uh, you know, items that you've created through Music City Bridge, you know, wrap over mm-hmm. tailpieces mm-hmm. And, and locking studs and uh, and things to fix the bracings and acoustics mm-hmm. and all, all sorts mm-hmm. of stuff that uh, and that's that inventor entrepreneur part of you that uh, you know, goes on and on. I mean, Joe, I got a qu- I'm sorry. Can I yeah. speak of that? I have a question. Have you always been that way? Like as a kid, were you the an inventor kind of kid? Were you? Did you want to take something apart and see how it was made as a kid? Yeah, and it started out with like firecrackers and apples, where you, you know, <laughs> put the firecracker and apple. And watch, yeah, it man. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I was going to say something about about the thing about people flying to town and all that. One thing I learned, I've learned over the years, is that. You have to say yes to everybody. My brother, who was a, he's the king of customer service, and he would lecture me from his experience of the airlines. He would say, you know, it's customer service. I go, yeah. Yes is the question. What is, I mean, yes is the answer. What is the question? That was his motto. And, and so I learned that. And a more complex version of it, I tell my guys at the shop and everybody, when I go travel and train people, I go, you got to be nice to everybody because you don't know who somebody is, particularly in Nashville. You don't, they're not going to tell you. In Nashville, right. one of the wonderful things is they're not going to say, I'm so and so, I played on all these records. You have to find that out for yourself. There's some people that do, but a yeah. lot don't. Yeah. Yeah. So, how long have you been here from Los Angeles? You know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there are people, yeah, with the exception of 
those guys who in Facebook, you know, so and so dies, and and they publish the picture of themselves with two seconds yeah, later yeah, with Jeff. Beck. Here I am with <laughs> sad to see Jeff Beck go. Here I am with Jeff Beck. You know, yeah. But you don't know who somebody is. <laughs> That's true. You don't know who they were, right? And you don't know who they will be. And and my whole career is ma- was made on t- giving, uh, making sure there was time for people who seemed to be on their way somewhere. You know, they had that glint in their eye, or they were. You watched them play, and, and he was like, "Wow, look at what did he just do?" Or just something. And you just don't know, do you? You, you yeah. just don't know. And the fact that Chet, for instance, this is remarkable. I have this picture in my shop of Chet and Steve. Oh, I love that same, picture. And they, it looks like one of those Christmas pictures of the angels. You know, the little <laughs> baby faces. And it's, it's wonderful. But Chet saw that. And he didn't... You look at these guys who are serial discoverers. They didn't bet on fully blown... People they built on people who were up and coming and very much in the infant stage, and that remarkable vision. Yeah, and some of it you don't know. Some of it's luck. You know, it's like I was I lucky that to, to build for Olander and these guys early on, Skaggs and you, or was it? I don't think so. I, you, I was a huge fan. I heard. You guys play, and it's like, okay, that that's what I'm interested in. But you have to bet on people well five years before they're successful. If you you know, guitar guys come up to me and go, Man, um, can you get a guitar to Keith Urban or whoever it is? I go, No, dude, you're forty years late. You know, you have to find those people when they're up and coming and when they come in and say, Man, I don't I don't really have the money now, but could you do this thing and I'll make it good and you have to go, Yes, don't worry about it. You have to, you, and this is true of the ideas. Like you're talking about the we, the things we, the, the tools and stuff, and so you know we build software and have done software startups. If you're not planning five years down the road ahead of the fa- the fad, musically it's true too. Ahead if you're curve, doing yep. you, it, to be to change the world, you, Randy Travis had to be so far ahead of the neo traditional country that people would listen to him and go, oh, not that. Because if he'd been the third guy doing it after he already made it successful, they'd go, well, yeah, here's a deal. We'll sign you. We hope to get 1% of the market. Whereas if you're that leading, whatever it is, you're going to get 20, 25% of the market. you got to bet on that. Does that make sense? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Wow. By the way, that picture... I'm playing bass. We were playing the song called Frog Kissing. And number two, it's in Hilversum, uh, the Netherlands. Uh, How do you know that? I just do. I don't know. <laughs> I know exactly where that is. It's uh, And the, the song you were doing. We I only sang a couple songs with him. As he only sang like two songs in the show. Mm-hmm. So, you know, he uh, I, I knew that. I could tell that was Frog. It's a song, I think... Uh, Buddy Cab wrote it. It's called Frog Kiss, and it's really That's funny. That's amazing. Did you know who took the picture? Mm-mm. So there's a guy named Manfred Pe- Peter, Pe- what, however it's pronounced. He's German. And he was a huge country music nut, still is. And he would come over here every year, and he'd go hang out with Fred Newell and stuff. And he'd come and he'd bring me all these pictures that he had taken because he was a photographer and a guitar player. I built a guitar for him. And um, he would b- bring the stack, and that was in that stack of stuff. So he <laughs> took it and he took that at that gig. I love the picture. I do too. I see. I love that you have it hanging there. That's fantastic. Chet would be loving that mm. too, man. That's cool.
Well, I want to thank Steve and Joe for, uh, and, and especially to Steve for making this oh, happen. Man. This was Steve's idea. So if it's a hit, it's I have to say, Ryan, my son, Ryan said, Dad, you, sh you, this yeah. is something you should do. I got to give him the, the kudos on yeah. that because well, I, and I appreciate you guys' time. You do so many cool things. All your stuff is wonderful. We, well, we're appreciative for what you do. Well, so many great interviews and. That, that's well, thank you. really true. Isn't it true? That's it's some changed. cool stuff. It's changed everything. Yeah, yeah. man. It's you guys are my heroes. So, oh, uh, man. Yeah. Joe, Both thanks you. for your time. Man. Yeah. It's thank so, you, Joe. So yeah. good. Thank yeah. you for all this, all these years. <laughs> yes. All right. Oh, so good. Bye-bye.